I'm Sibylle Peters. I'm 47 years old and I'm working in the theater of research since 2001. In 2001 we, we founded the theater of research or it happened to, I don't know, come into being in a way. Uh, uh, so that is 18 years ago and since then I work in the, in the theater of research with kids, for kids, but also with and for adults. So the work has been transgenerational from, from the very start. So we always said that in the theater of research, children, artists and scientists work together as researchers. That is kind of our first self-description. And I came to this work from a more uh, university-based job where I, uh, I was a researcher in philosophy and literature, um, um, made my PhD there and I felt, uh, I mean, I've, I've worked in theater, I made theater all my life, but not on a prof really professional level. But um, after 10 years in the university, I felt that um, the research that I did there was very secluded. Um, I was kind of, it, it was a very lonely business in a way. And I also felt that the results that my research, that I found in my research, I couldn't really share them with many people or I didn't find a way to kind of, and, and that is mainly what, what was the drive behind creating the theater of research, to find a way to, to make these cultural studies that I did before in a way more applied and share not only the results, but also the research itself more with other people, with non, from, not from academia, basically. And that it turned out to be kids was partly coincidental, but uh, it just turned out that they were really good co-researchers for, for me, for my team back then. You, because you also have an adult project running beside your own, uh, your own company. You yeah, besides the theater of research, uh, around the same time when I started the work in, in theater of research, we also founded an perf a performance collective, an art collective called Geheimagentur, or translated as, can be translated as secret agency. And um, we still work in that collective, and that is about... Um, also participatory and research oriented uh, topics, but well, that is we, the theater of research has a home in a children's theater, in a theater for children, in the Fundus Theater, and the Fundus Theater um, more and more transforms into the theater of research. Now the whole Fundus Theater is the theater of research, but in the beginning the theater of research was a small seed in the Fundus Theater, right? And um, the secret agency isn't based in a, in a venue, basically. That is a free group and we do projects once or twice a year in the realm of a big festival or something like that, where we do participatory artwork. Mm. Yeah, apart from that, I also still work with universities and in universities, so partly as a, yeah, yeah, as a part of my work in the theater of research, um, we, for example, uh, had uh, graduate programs here where people could do um, PhDs with partly theoretical and partly practical research. So art-based research also. So the theater of research became a place or it's more and more, more and more became a place where we actually do research together children and adults between kindergarten and PhD program and and in many projects actually all these levels somehow come together like for example very very strongly in for example in the Kinderbank project where you can see all those different levels working together somehow. Kinderbank was a project actually that was um, parallelly developed for the theater of research and by the secret agency. And the theater of research, and it was a project that started with um, discussions we had during the financial crisis, where we had the feeling that 
the experts that we have, that societies have experts or, or on all kinds of topics. So we also have experts on finances, right? And it seemed that these experts on finances kind of had not obviously not the best interest of everybody in mind, right? So the whole research about money seemed to have deviated from, I don't know, we create knowledge so things work better and we had the feeling, okay, the whole research about money, what money actually is, how it works, how it could work differently, we have to reclaim that research from the experts. We have we have to do it ourselves, though we don't know much about it now, or maybe because we don't know much about it now, because those so-called experts who know so much about it, like really fucked it up for everybody. <laughs> so um, that was the starting point of the Kinderbank uh, project. And um, we teamed up in the theater of research, we teamed up with, with children to do research about money, because on the other hand, very important for the project was the, um, the children's poverty that we have here in Hamburg, especially if you see how rich the city is. I mean, the theater of research is based in Hamburg and is one of the richest cities in Europe. But um, one, of, one out of five kids in Hamburg is still uh, poor, suffers from poverty. So, and then among our audiences, it's a much higher percentage, actually, because we work a lot with schools and and children from from not so privileged areas of the of the city so um the work of the theater of research is very much based on wish production and so we are collecting all these wishes of children a lot from the very beginning we did that so very open kind of wish collection rounds and often kids say we want to be rich and we felt that we cannot work with this wish for a very long time because we don't know what to do about it, right? And then in the financial crisis, we got information about alternative banking and projects like community currencies and self-made money, basically. And um, we thought, wait a minute, maybe with this methodology, basically, of, of a local currency, we could make a setup where... Um, Possibly we could work with this wish of the kids to be rich. Maybe they will feel rich when we have a local currency and they can print their own money and we will all feel rich. Maybe not. So maybe that is a good open research question that we have there for, for, for kids to get involved into, into this research. Um, yeah, and that's exactly uh, what we did. Actually, because... Geheimagentur, secret agency, did kind of the same project with adults in the inner city of Oberhausen, which is a bankrupt, or was a, back then, a bankrupt city uh, in, in Western Germany. Um, so uh, together, we first went to Brazil to learn from the Banco Palmas, which is the most um, um, successful, if you want to, alternative bank in the world uh, that made local currency for now, I think, two dozen places in Brazil. We went to, um, to Fortaleza in Brazil to learn from them and also brought them over somehow to help development in Germany. Um, and so that was a very important uh, knowledge transfer there. And then uh, we teamed up here in the theater of research with a group from, uh, of students from the university who were from the Hafen City University who were interested into um, how um, local cur currencies can be used in city development in a way. Um, and also with a uh, few experts for, on children's poverty and on well, um, local currencies and so on. And then with a school here around the corner, the Grundschule Richardstraße, um, and with first with two uh, uh, classes, two groups of children in that school, third grade, like 50, around 50 kids we started with. In the, uh, later on in the project, the whole school got involved. But at that point, it was 50 kids, third graders, so about eight, nine years old around from this area around here and with this team students scientists we theater makers and kids we started the children's bank of hamburg um, and um, basically this project worked like this 
that we went around here in the neighborhood between the school and the theater and we convinced um, little shops and services to become part of the network of the children's bank and in these shops you would then get something for our alternative currency and the kids the 50 kids um, learned a little bit about the um, history of money and what has been money that at some point even like stones or all kinds of material have been money and um, they created the bills from this knowledge and this research into the very different ways money very different forms money took throughout history they took inspiration and they made um, little sculptures that which were money for or they suggested as money each kid did one and we photographed them and we put each of these sculptures on a bill and so um, the kids also decided what a money's name should be or yeah what we should call our money and they called it Abenteuergeld which is adventure money and they also decided that there should be no less than a hundred adventure money so one bill is a hundred and there shouldn't be any smaller bills and um, well in these shops that we then so the students mainly in the beginning worked on building up this network of shops and convinced shop owners and so on to take part and um, in these shops you would then have a sign in the window saying we are part of the children's bank and then you can go in there like with a bill of your adventure money and then you will get something there for adventure money not everything so adventure money was never interchangeable with euros but you would always get something so kids would go into the shop and for example a sports shop and say what can I get here for adventure money and then in the sports shop for example you would get uh, 15 minutes training in table tennis and then could have a play table tennis there for an hour or in, in a, a, a fruit shop you would get the fruit that is kind of next day you can't sell it anymore anyway you would get it for the adventure money then and every time a different fruit every day and then yeah different kinds of services like that um, and at some point two dozen shops and services here around in the neighborhood were part of the network and they were interested in and we found and this is something that we we didn't know in the beginning the small shops were actually interested to become part of the children's bank network because uh, they felt that okay i mean with adventure money we all wouldn't be able to shop it was just it was the children's money right so only children could go pay with it and so the shop owners felt okay maybe the children will pay with adventure money then but they will bring their parents and they will then pay something with or buy something with euros so and also it would strengthen the small shop structure and not everybody would always go to the mall right which is obviously a big problem here like everywhere I guess that the small shops kind of are struggling and so yeah that that's how we built the setup and then um, with the currency in place and the network in place we started to have assemblies here in the theater and that's kind of the a little bit a small theater part of that project <laughs> that we had um, assemblies here that were ca carefully devised of all the um, what is the Aktionärsversammlung in English stakeholders assembly right and we would have all the stakeholders meaning the students the kids and the shop owners and the adult experts all in the assembly and we would um, do reports um, from every diff from, from all the different perspectives about our findings and the status of the project and so on. And the assembly mainly the, the main purpose of the assembly was then to decide how much money can we print. And that was also the, the, the question around which like learning happened for all of us because that's actually an important question also the the Bundesbank or the, or the Eurobank or have to consider how much money is actually in circulation, right? And well, circulation actually was a, was a bit of a problem in the children's bank, but that's maybe a detail. Anyway, so the kids, the kids invented the, the kids in terms of co-creation. Should I talk about co-creation in this? 
Perspective. We, can, we can come back to that. Oh yeah, you can yes. come back to that. Okay. Yeah, we, we can get back to the co-creation thing. Mm. If you, if you could also just say a little bit about uh, 50 dangerous things. Yeah. Um, well, for a long time, the theater of research mainly did long-term research projects, which means. The Kinderbank is an example. It is a project that in this initial phase, before we even started to kind of make, to, to export it to other places or make small versions of it, or the first Kinderbank project took about a year to develop, right? And we really worked a year with these 50 kids and then made it bigger from there. Um, and um, other projects were not quite as extensive, but still were kind of over a longer period of time. But um, we felt that we would also like to work with smaller kids, with kids from three, three years, and um, started to make pieces for them. And we found that working with them in a long-term project didn't make so much sense because if you see them and then you see them again 10 days later, you have to start over, right? There's no, like, they don't... They, they are not interested in this kind kind of a time span, right? So you have to have yeah you have to create have to have an experience together that is happening within one two three hours or something, and then they go off to go into another experience, and it's difficult to get back then. And that is that was the first impulse to do these other kinds of projects, which are more really stage performance like with a beginning and an end and an audience and so on the first thing that we did for smaller kids that was like more like a stage performance with a beginning and an end was liquids and um, that was much more successful than we than we thought it was it still is i mean it is like about 10 years now we play it still 20 times a year and it's always sold out like forever like 10 years i don't know anyway we felt that well, we have to do more like that. And um, I found a book. It's actually based on the main impulse, I think, was the book of the same name. 50 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Children Do. is a book by Tinkering Unlimited, um, which are from, it's a group from California who, are, who, who create setups for experimental tinkering. And, and um, they made this book full of instructions, what kids should do, dangerous things kids should do. And uh, reading this book, I felt um, it, it reminded me of the instruct the, the way life art and the history of performance art works with instructions. And I felt that maybe there's a chance for, for a kind of stage performance to blend this, these instructions which are in this book. And then the... Um, the um, the instructions from from live art and and maybe the history of live art also because there are so many live art obviously also has like this affair with danger right or so many dangerous actions and so on and this is how how that that started and then we were talking to kids about it a lot and we found that there was a huge desire for doing risky things and that on the other hand there is a system of responsibilities and safety and health and safety and so on in place that makes it more and more difficult for kids to do to explore risk in a way and so we felt yeah that's actually something we should we should work about and so we created this this piece uh, uh, that that is dagefa uh, uh, in which um, we do yeah it's a research of risk um, and we invite children in this play to do risky things with us. And it is, of course, always a negotiation between, okay, we don't want to avoid the risk, we want to go towards the risk. But this also means, of course, to kind of think about, say, and kind of calculate risk or, uh, yeah. So it's a way of, of uh, we try to develop um, an approach that would enable kids and adults to explore risk together. Because usually in terms of danger, kids and adults are on two different sides of the, of the river in a way or of the border. You know that adults always, always, especially with smaller kids, have to create safety, right? I don't know, that doesn't have to do if they are 
especially scary or easily scared or not, or what kind of character they have. That's just what you have to do as an adult with small kids. You constantly have to create safety in some form, right? And that's also going on your nerves a lot. I mean, if you are a parent or also for kindergarten teachers, that you're always this, stop, no, you can't do this much today. No, out. And, and so um, we, we, we thought maybe it would, be a good, it would be a good thing to develop an approach that kind of um, bridges this conflict. So that if a kid wants to do something that is dangerous, that you don't have to react anymore with, uh, you can't do that, but you can say, can take that as an invitation for research and say, ah, oh, it's interesting that you want to do that. It's actually pretty risky, but maybe we can do it if we do this, 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 this. And then you create a setup and then you can do it together. So you can change your approach from the one who is always hindering everything to becoming a team that is exploring and enabling exploration. I think that's the main thing about 50 Dangerous Things. The theme about danger is also pretty important in playing up. Yeah. That's one of the categories. Can you tell a bit about that? And of course, up? of course. Um, yeah, I mean, to do play, the, in, the impulse to do playing up was actually not ours, but it was an um, Uh, it came from the Life Art Development Agency in London, who asked me if I could create a resource to let children know about life art, basically. Because, and I actually only realized that then, when Life Art Development Agency pointed that out, children don't know about life art. I mean, children know about lots of things, lots of art forms. And also they engage in lots of art forms. But if you ask them, do you know life art? Do you know performance art? Never heard of it, right? So obviously Life Art Development Agency had an interest to change that. Um, I wasn't sure if I have an interest to change that actually in the very beginning because in our other research projects, we tend not to tell children that this is all about theater, you know, because it kind of didn't help with the research. And, and um, or that if this is performance, it was more that performance strategies were our kind of trick box, toolbox that we used then for the research with the kids, you know, so. And, and of course, also I felt that, oh, you know, um, so much theater work with children is oriented towards making them understand theater, you know, and obviously I don't find that so interesting. Um, as an approach. So I was a bit hesitant, but um, then again, actually, and that also was related to 50 Dangerous Things because the Life Art Development Agency asked us if we could come up with that because they saw the performance of 50 Dangerous Things in which life art or performance art was a part or, yeah was a part of that performance and they said, okay, maybe they, they are the right ones to, to create this resource. And um, so um, I thought about it and I understood at some point that it is not so much us who have to bring, I don't know, life art to the kids but maybe it's more it is an important thing that kids could bring their input to life art right so if you don't tell them about life art and performance art because you kind of as this was my intention right keep it as your trick box um, then they ca can't obviously use the trick box or the toolbox or the frame for for their own things right and so life art and performance art being unknown to kids also means that life and performance art would have to miss out on the input of the kids on the art form. I mean, obviously not on everything else. We had lots of input from kids on money, on all the other research topics that we had, but we never had their input on live art or performance art itself, right? So I felt that the resource should enable kids and adults to... Um, experience live art and performance art together, but also give them the opportunity to actually do live art or call something live art or performance art. 
Um, yeah, and so um, playing up is uh, was made as a, again as a series of instructions which are based on somehow important works of the history of performance art or life art in six different categories that we found or dimensions actually kid, the kids I first worked with on playing up or the kids who tested for, first tested the game they came up with a much better idea than categories they said okay that's dimensions of life art so it's actually six different dimensions of life art and um, each has six different instructions and tells six different stories about life art and about a certain piece that the or and a certain artist that the instruction then is based on. So you can make some kind of little reenactment of that performance piece. Yeah, and so um, life art. Uh, so playing up was meant to enable not only kids to learn about performance art, but it was for kids and adults to become life artists and performance artists and kind of claim this art form for for themselves because obviously i mean also in professional performance art and life art there are many reenactments so just doing a reenactment does not mean that your work is secondary to the initial artwork but it's just one form of creation reenacting something reinterpreting something yeah and that that worked very well, I think. And when we launched it in Tate Modern in 2016, I think, um, playing up created something unexpected for me or the feeling or the experience of it was kind of unexpected because it, what it created, I mean, to say this first, I think the idea of playing up is pretty straightforward, you know? I mean, if you were asked, come up with a resource for people to learn about performance art, kind of to do a series of instructions is pretty, I mean, it's not far-fetched, right? So what, what happened then with this game was unexpected anyway, because not only were children were, were really happy to work, to work with the game, also in schools and so on. And after two days of working with the game, they were able to describe what performance art and live art is and raise questions about it and so on. So you felt like, okay, you don't have to study that for four years or it's not like this art form is so complicated, we keep it for later or something like that. You know, it was really like, okay, you play, play this, you, you reenact stuff or you reinterpret work for two days and then you kind of, <laughs> you're kind of on top of the game, right? So that was uh, amazing how accessible this actually is, right? It's, so it is, a, it is the opposite of what life and performance art sometimes might think of itself or especially of how life art and performance art is conceived a lot in society that it is very complicated and awkward and somehow difficult art form. No, it seemed to be an extremely accessible art form, much more accessible than most of the other art forms that you have to train first because you, before you can actually do them. Um, you can, uh, as live art and performance art works so much with practices from the everyday um, that you can jump right into it. And then really with the experience that you have as a kid playing and performing in the everyday, you can master it right, very quickly. And so that was one thing that really worked out with that one. And then also the game itself played in the, in the Turbine Hall, created this transgenerational public, this feeling of a transgenerational public. That was something that even here, even though we are here in a theater for children, we often, we have more than we had at that point, 15 years of experience of bringing children and adults together, we still felt for the first time that playing up, that just giving people cards and uh, props to deal with the cards and then let them wander off in some part of that space and just do it, created this, this space of e transgenerational equality that we never achieved before really, or is, was very difficult to achieve before for us. Um, and so um, it was a, an important impu impulse for us to reconsider how 
successful we actually were with our transgenerational idea of bringing children and adults together as researchers, which we had from the beginning. But we felt that actually, oh, this is how generational equality feels. Okay, so now we have to kind of re reassess also the other work a little bit, right? And since then we are much more radical in terms of what transgenerational equality in the projects means or how to conceptualize that in the beginning or in which project that is actually the focus and in which it might not be because some other, well, it is made still for creating a stage performance for kids groups, basically, which is the business of this house still. I would love to hear some more about how you do that, the, the new strategies for creating real equality, transgenerational equality. You're saying you're much more radical now. How can I put that? I mean, for example, right, in a project like Kinderbank, talking about co-creation in that project, that was earlier than playing up, right? It was four years, five years earlier. And in that project, children have like a very important active part because they gave kind of the impulse, which is true for most of our projects, in their wishes, in their wish to be rich, was kind of the initial impulse. They also created the currency itself and they, they were the main subjects whose experience was, um, I mean, so we, it, it was the kids who could say, okay, now I actually feel richer with this money or actually I don't because I can only get these old apples there, right? But I want the grapes and I cannot buy them. So actually it's kind of a trick or I don't know, or some, all kinds of problems actually came up with this. So the kids were kind of the master, the masters and the main subjects of that research, right? So if we were successful or not was decided by the kids. However, the setup of the project that to decide to do it, to understand, okay, we can take the Banco Palmas model and we can just put it on our neighborhood here in Eilbeck in a way. We have to adapt it in a way and so on. That was all decisions only adults made, right? Only when all the setup was in place, the children would, and of course not the children who initially made the wish, but just random children from the neighborhood came in and we we introduced them basically to the setup that we made and asked them if they want to participate. But basically the chance was to say yes or no, right? <laughs> I mean, it was not yes, but let's do it in a different way or something like that, right? And <clears throat> I have to say that I do not have a problem with this. For, for still many of our projects work like this, right? Um, because I think that what is often what is often a problem, especially if you talk now about art-based research projects, is that many people have a longing. Or it, I also work with lots of students and young people on this, and they often come with a longing that everybody should have the same say in this, right? Like from the very beginning and so on, and it creates a situation that is not taking into account that people have very different starting points and very different interests also in a project and very different resources of time and money. I mean, we are paid for it, they're not paid for it, right? I mean, just in the kinder bank, it's a little, in the kinder, in the children's bank, it's a bit special because somehow they get paid for it. <laughs> often, often it's only us getting paid for it, right? And so also it is kind of, I mean, to put together a project as you, we all know, has very, very tedious parts, right? Like, and and um, boring, boring and very time-consuming parts children are really zero interested in, right? And so I often said that, or and I also teach that if you put together a, heterogene a heterogeneous group of participants in a research project that is transdisciplinary, transgenerational and so on, that you have to take into account the different stakes and interests and starting points and resources that different groups have and that, the, that you have to create their partaking and decision making from that. So 
I often use a, use an example for that from from a from a different project from the ghost insurance to to explain that a bit more. Can I use it here, or is that yes, not helpful? Course. Yeah. So, for example, in the ghost insurance, we created a framework that is based on ethnography and psychologic psychology and stuff like that. How you can go into a school and map this school in a way with this idea of the genius loci, the spirit of the place, right? So this whole setup, how this methodology of how can that actually happen, that you go and look for a spirit of the place and how can you work with that concept and so on, that is all, that is invented by adults who actually can take the time and know the vocabulary to read Isabel Stengers and whatever kind of theory is in there, right? And psychogeography and so on. But then this methodology is used by the kids of the school to create, to find or create, I mean, it's a little bit in between, right? With spirits of the place. So the spirits of the place which are created in this process are totally created by the kids, right? We bring the methodology and they then create and find the spirits of their school, which can be all kinds of spirits. That's a long other story. But um, we, couldn't we couldn't find or create the spirits of the school because we don't know the school and we don't know how it feels to sit there every day and how, how this spirit of boredom comes towards you, right? And from which corner. But um, they, they know that, so they create the spirits and the ghosts, but we create beforehand the methodology of the ghost insurance. And I feel that this is, a, in many, many projects, a necessary um, um, division of labor, in a way. So lots of content is brought from kids. Also, initial impulses. What is it actually that we should look at in our work or that we should make a project about? That's also kids, right? But structure and setup of a research project, that is something that we do as adults. That we are responsible to do that. That's what I felt for a very long time. Yeah, and, and I still think that, I, though I understand, I understood after playing up that it is also worth to create setups in which children, in which, inter, in which transgenerational equality is really in the focus, right? And so after playing up, the next project that I started was Kaput, the Academy of Destruction, and in that project, um, there are six um, professors of destruction, which are artists and researchers, adults, and then there are six experts on destruction, which are kids. And they have the same budget and they have the same saying within the Academy of Destruction. But of course, any still the setup to create an Academy of Destruction, that we will have six professors, adults, six professors, kids, how that we will do this and that over four days and how, all that, how much the budget is, what it actually are the research questions that we, how do we find the kids and the adults? This is all done by the team, adult re theater of research team. And um, I find it sometimes a bit tedious if people work too hard on kind of hiding the fact that obviously this is our job <laughs> to, to, to kind of get all of us at this to the starting point, you know. We, we cannot make children responsible for all of us coming to the starting point of a research project or to set it up or to find the money for it or to find a first approach. Um, yeah, I think that is... It's, uh, it's wrong to try and hide that for the sake of total equality and openness. Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit about long-term <coughs> effect might be the wrong word, but, but what effect does it have on the kids long-term after they have been in a project like this, compared to more seeing a more uh, stage show like uh, 50 Dangerous Things, then to be in a project like uh, Kaput. Kaput, where they have spent lots of time, spent 
really a lot of thinking. I'm not sure if I have, I know that is what you are after. But um, we do not, I mean, if you work in, in this field, in performance with and for kids, that is basically called, though it is not, it is basically called and financed as cultural education, right? As you know very well. And in cultural education, to get this money, you are often asked to prove your effects, the effect of your work, right? And somehow, we, 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 we tried to escape from this urge a lot. Like, you know, we kind of let it blank or told an anecdote instead, or I don't know, you often have to do that. And a report after you got a lot of money, a report. And then, you know, I, I also find it a bit transgressive then to ask, for example, the teacher for to say what is wanted there is like the teacher says we had so much conflict in the group before and now they are all getting along so much better you know and and then also the um, the the children who never said something also participate now and you know and I kind of think that is transgressive in a way maybe after the academy of destruction problems in a group and at school get much worse you know and it still can be a good sign, I think, right? <laughs> so, um, I can say something about um, su sustainability from my own perspective, and this is some, a strategy that I often use in these situations, that I say, I can say for myself, which performances which experiences of art in my childhood were extreme were like shaping for my life right and i if i if i remember those experiences and like think about it from to from a, the perspective of being a professional today i can see though they are very different experiences that they were all coming from a very strong background it was not a coincidental thing that happened on the street with some artist who just had their flute and was just fantastic, you know, that also can happen. But actually it was, there was a lot of money and preparation and study and discourse behind each of these experiences that I had when I was young. That was so, so important then for me that I understood, wow, you can do, I want that, you can do that, imagine, like, you know, these kind, this kind of experience. So I think that it's actually, very important to put a lot of these experiences which have this the, the sustainability of the of the unique moment right the sustainability of the unique moment to achieve that you really have to put something into a structure an institution um, a discourse right it, it, it needs a lot of work to create the sustainability of the unique moment. But I still think that it is very important for us artists to respect the sustainability of the moment and don't fall for, for the ideology of sustainability that we now have to work with a group every week because that's so much better if you, as if you just meet them once, you know? In this experiences, I, just, I was just a visitor Right. I was just in, sitting in the audience, having my mind blown. Right. It was just a moment, and still it was sustainable, like, like hell, you know. So it was really, um, really, really important. And I don't, I mean, there was no, no experience, like a project experience, that I, these things didn't exist when I was, was a kid. But I, I felt threatened uh, in my... I felt that my art form was threatened at a certain point by the paradigm of sustainability, especially in cultural education. That is always telling you, you can, uh, or now these days is often telling you, you could, can't do an event, you have to kind of work with a school over three years, you know, and kind of meet the kids again and again and again. I'm not sure, actually. I'm not, I don't know if that's what you want to hear. But I'm not sure that that is more sustainable than putting all the work in the moment. 
I don't know. We want to hear what you're saying. So <laughs> that, that is what we want to hear. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because we also doubt this. We are not, yeah. we're not con convinced about other or we just like to hear your, your view on it. So it mm. is very much what, you, what we would like to hear. Mm. I was kind of laughing when this whole sustainability thing came up because I felt that we are now fucked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the, I always, when I started off, I believed a lot in, in, in this, okay, we cannot change the world completely, but we can create these temporary autonomous zones, which are really different, kind of, in a way. But, but I think <laughs> I can, of course, also from my childhood, point out certain experiences that, was, <coughs> that has been shaping me. But I also, I didn't have the possibility to go into any art projects when I was a kid. Mm. Do you think that would they, they would, it would shape the kids differently, that being in, involved in some pre projects like this, than just watching good art? I think, I do think that some of the kids, which I also remember vividly, you know, from, from projects that I did, were, are going to think about that their whole life, that they know that money can be made differently, that time can be made differently, that that, that will enrich their capacities to create the life they want for themselves. I do believe that. But um, I also feel that it is okay to kind of not test it. <laughs> I don't know, you know, just let them walk with it. I'm not sure if it can be tested, but you will find out and tell me. I'm really interested in what you will find out about that, you know, because I didn't, which is partly also because I feel that some of the kids or I, I worked with and who kind of made an impression on me, and I will not forget them, they will not forget us, is um, not very privileged kids who would not have a chance to take part in something like a theater club. They basically come here because their school takes responsibility to bring them here or to create this or to host this relationship. School and theater are kind of hosting it, this, really, this experience, right? And um, to keep in touch with these kids, we, e we even tried, but it's very, very difficult to even if they want to, you know, they're eager to be a part of the team for longer than the project goes. There's actually no chance for them to do that because their parents can't be bothered to bring them now to, to a theater of all places at the weekend. You know, they really have other problems or other things or other interests. And so especially the kids who I think personally, not professionally, my impression is that they um, have, have most they got most out of it, right? They are 10 years old and I just say goodbye to them because I know it's not possible for them to keep the relationship without anyone hosting it, right? And I cannot, at Kaput, we, where we tried that, where we had these six destruction expert kits, which were also found, I mean, these were kits, some of them, uh, we found them in doing playing up workshops in schools and we felt that those kids might be qualified to be experts of destruction who were actually destructive, right, in some form. And so um, not all of them, but most of them were actually destructive in some form. And so um, they were also most of them not, re not privileged at all. And so I had to when we then worked with them, I had to personally go in the morning and get them from their house, right? To get them from their house to the theater to make sure that they will actually be able to take part. And in even doing that, I already transgressed any form of insurance that I could ever have for that. If I would get into an accident with them, I would not be insured for what happens to them through my false driving or something you know so so even in even with the most personal um 
I don't know, with so much like personal energy that I put in that for them to participate and be, be the professors of the Academy of Destruction, getting them there in the morning. I mean, that was Hamburg now, not London, right? In London, there was someone hosted that. But here in Hamburg, I had to get them in the morning to make them able to participate here as professors. And that was... Actually, at some point, Hanno, the, our, our executive director, told me, you actually can't do that, really. It's not. We cannot. If something happens, it's, it's a catastrophe. And I said, well, I don't, I don't care. We have to do it like that now, you know. But to keep a relationship, even a short one going, personally, between the theater and one of those kids who are not so privileged, like our kids, is almost impossible, my experience. So I don't know about their long term effects of Kinderbank or, or that, all that. In order to work with kids at co-creators, is there, does it demand a certain kind of approach? Of course it do, but a certain kind of artist or, or certain strategies to work with kids? Is there something you shouldn't do or should do? Oh man, there are so many things you shouldn't do. I mean, most people talk to, I mean, the, the difference between kids and adults that we are now just talking about as if it would exist is the first, is the start of the, of the problem, right? I mean, the, the difference between kids and adults, that's just a binary like man, woman, human, animal, um, adults, kids, right? That is, these, these are binaries which are constructed in a way where one part of the binary is weak and the other is strong. Like human is strong, animal is weak, man is strong, woman is weak, and adults are strong and kids are weak. That's how the binary, how the whole difference is made up, right? So obviously, just in treating kids, children appropriate is already wrong in a way, right? We have to kind of kind of ignore the difference, I think, as much as possible, if you really, if you are, I mean, as I said before, in, in, the, in how I, I understand my responsibility, I obviously do not ignore it, but if we sit in a room and we now, if, if we are present, kids, adults are present, and we are about to, to explore something or to create something, in that moment, you have to ignore the fact that some are kids, some are adults. We're just people working together, right? Mm. Reciprocal empowerment, that is a point that I find very important and that I also teach a lot. That many, um, many people who start working with kids so much want to empower them, right? I mean, they want to empower them. <laughs> and actually, it doesn't really work if you want to empower someone. But often, you it ends up with them feeling that they don't have any power themselves. You know, how are you with empowering someone if you don't have power yourself, really, right? You want to... Many, many people who start working with kids, especially in, feel very bad about how kids are organized or controlled in schools and want to change something about that, for example, or how kids generally are powerless and so on. But then if you put yourself there and try to empower them, you find that you actually don't have the power yourself to change these things, right? And then you get really unhappy and the whole project goes south often. And I feel that it is very important to find the spot in co-creation in which you empower you in which both sides empower each other right i think that is a crucial thing that i i could say for example for the kinderbank children's bank project that um of course i kind of empowered poor with this project with bringing this project i helped to empower poor children to be able to have a powerful shopping experience because suddenly they had like, you know, um, big money and they could invite their friends and say, okay, we go first play table tennis and we could look, watch some Star Wars there and we get some sweets here. And, you know, that's something that poor children usually don't have this experience of the power of shopping. So, yes, I brought that. But on the other hand, 
the children really empowered me to to create or empowered us adults in the project to intervene in money production you know like we can usually we are also powerless when it comes to money right money is just the system that we we're just the users of the system and the system constantly extract where and from us somehow you know but um with the kids as as um as accomplices as partners we could create a system in which we actually had the feeling we can create money in a different way we can claim back our our right to to create money as a medium for community or society or a certain public uh, a feeling that i didn't have i mean all of us i think felt extremely helpless in the financial crisis like extreme God, right but then only with the, to make partners with the kids allowed us to feel that we can we can claim back our power over money and it made them all and, and, and it empowered them in the same it it empowered them also in a different way but somehow empowerment has to go both ways i think for a good co-creation co Selbstwirksamkeit. Selbstwirksamkeit. That is a term that is has been very important for a few years in the German discussion. That is something that cultural education wants to um, wants to create. That children have the feeling of being effective themselves, mm -hmm. right? And then um, often you kind of if you then have kids on stage who kind of stay there say i tell stories or make a biographical sub take a biographical subject position and so on okay so everybody looks at you you say it you are seen you are acknowledged you get applause but is this kind of getting attention is that really already being effective that was a very important thing especially in the in the kinderbank development that we felt Actually, um, we our own Selbstwirksamkeit, feeling effective, is very much um, is is very much harmed by the financial crisis <laughs> because all the ways like we think we can create our small little life by um, uh, organizing our finance finances around it can be totally shattered by something like the financial crisis, and nobody feels very Selbstwirksam anymore, right? So actually to kind of partner up and say, okay, we want to be self self effect we want to feel effective about money, not about that we will get attention at that some point, you know, that's not being effective. But to to take back power over money, that would be really feeling effective, right? So we said, okay, the project is not about everybody standing in the assembly and getting the attention the the selbstwirksamkeit means okay if we team up in the neighborhood with very different people with it, it, we can make a team from heterogeneous partners then at that team we will be effective in a in a totally different dimension we will, will be effective because we create our own money right so that was we argued a lot around that in that project to kind of get rid of this okay you have to put a kid center stage so it, it will feel effective right yeah. yeah you already talked a bit about co-creation mm. the question is how far can you take co-creation how far can you bring a kid to be creative themselves can they go and create their own concept their own shows uh, their own art Yeah, you know there are other examples, of course, and yeah. internationally of people pushing these borders and seeing how far you can go. Yeah, I think we we are we are constantly pushing that in different directions. You know, I mean, um, after the Kinderbank project kind of went into the background a little bit and wasn't the main project anymore that we were focusing on. Of course, we went back to. Euros. Everything was every the the, the theater itself is running on euros. So, 
we, we were thinking, can we, for example, give children real power over the money? Because what I often see when it is about empowering kids is, okay, you give them the power about what is going to happen in this room in the next hour or what kind of text would you like to speak or what kind of costume would you like to wear? But very, I, not to my knowledge, children are actually empowered to take the production in their hands, which is basically dealing with finances, right? And so uh, the follow-up project for the Kinderbank was actually, there's no business like show business where we said, okay, um, if you divide our overall budget for a year through the amount of events that we are doing in the theater, you will get a certain amount of money that we put in each event, which, which was at the time 3,000 euro per event in this house. This is what we put in one event. And so we gave 50 kids 3,000 bucks and said, okay, you make, you can, you are not support, you are not necessarily on stage. You are not necessarily, you know, you don't, we don't put them on stage and then devise them and make it seem as if they have the power but they get the production money. We, we put them in, in the position of the producer, actually. And that is the, then the beginning of the sugar project again, you know, because then they, the children came up with, okay, we have a... So usually these 50 kids would make different, have different ideas what to do with the money, how to produce a show, and then they would pitch these ideas and then we would select, they would select it, vote for it. And then basically we had three groups with each a budget of a thousand euro. And then the, I, then what children, what the children said we should do, what they wanted to do with a thousand euro was often very much contrary to how we would approach it, right? We buy sweets for it. We, we give it all to some B celebrity just to appear in the theater so we can all get an autograph. Or, um, well, we will invite as many, pup, as many um, dog puppies as we can get for a thousand euro and put them on stage and look at them for 20 minutes. And, you know, like really radical approaches that we then had to kind of... I mean, we gave all the three different groups in the team like that, like 15 to 15, 18 kids in a group would get one production assistant. So I was production assistant for one of these groups and the other teams, other members of the team were production assistants to other kids groups. And we kind of were struggling in the way that I told you in the beginning about the sugar project. We were struggling. Okay, so now they want to spend it all on sweets. How do we make now a 20 minute scene out of that? Or how do we actually, where are the problems in getting, in finding puppies? Or, you know, like really working with that. So we kind of try to empower them in that way. And, and that was co-creation in a very radical way because they actually had the power over how to spend the money. Mm, but we, of course, were, tricksters behind the scenes and still kind of made somehow a show out of that and we got kind of good at that to create shows out of the far out ideas possible that children had right about it so that was one approach um and the, the kaput academy where we said okay we have kids professors and adult professors and they all have the same budget and the same time span for what they want to do with it with uh, what what they want to destroy? That was the main question in that project. That every all the professors had to answer: What do I want to destroy? Uh, so I think there is not really one methodology of co-creation, but each and every project of theater of research has its own setup of how roles are distributed and who of decision making and and of who takes which part in it you know and it's not that we have one methodology of co-creation that we can put on everything but it's a different form of co-creation in each project and it's exactly the research that we do to kind of see how also as in a social experiment that is always different how does this form of co-creation turn out yeah Maybe people even would, but I don't know if there's a lot of research about long-term effects on adults if they take part in cultural projects, you know. Are they followed then five years later? So how does that work out for you now? 
right? I mean, no, because, and, and that is because we think that taking part in art and experiencing art and using the space of art for something, for negotiation or expression or research or whatever is just part of the richness of life, right? That's what, what is the sweet life is about, you know? It's, it's, and it's not, it doesn't depend on if it makes you better. Only with children we think about if it makes them better in a way, you know, with adults we don't. And that should, yeah, that should make us skeptical about, <laughs> about that. That's back to your approach that children shouldn't be treated differently than, than adults. Yeah. And that's, of course, very important. So the whole mm -hmm. question here should, we should be able to put it to adults as well <coughs> and make, they should be able to, to answer it as well. Mm -hmm. Fine. Right. Yeah. So, but still you are working with children and not taking a big group of adults and children into the theater and working with them. Yeah, we would like to. I mean, we try to make a program also now, especially next season, we will have a new focus on, on weekend programs, which are accessible then for kids and adults alike. But that is also just a structural thing, you know, because we work mainly in the week, in the day. And um, we work for kids who come from kindergartens and from schools to us. And uh, there's just not an adult public that is available to take part in in art on a Tuesday morning from 10 to 11.30. So it's also a structural problem. <laughs>